His strength is perfect. Uh, this last week, uh, I was walking through just fellowshipping and with different ones, and I'm sort of a hands-on person sometimes. Maybe y'all know that. But I, I'll touch somebody or put my arm around them or something like that. And this last week, I walked up to someone and I just sort of touched them. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go any further than that just because I don't want that person to know who, who they are. But uh, I touched someone. And when I did, I can't express to you uh, the blessing that I felt. I don't know how to explain that, but I just, all of a sudden, I just got so much help by just touching that person and just got blessed. And God spoke to me and, and said, you know, Doyce, there's something in a touch. And I got to reading about different touches that where Jesus touched people and, and where people were touched in different areas and the effect that it had on people. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to share with you the power that we can find in God's touch. In God's touch. You know, it's a, it's a power that you can, we can find nowhere else. I received help from that, just touching that individual. A blessing. It was just a strange deal. But, you know, when God touches us, there's no power like that. There's no help. You can't find any greater help than when he really touches you. And if you, he's ever, ever really touched you in, in a very special way, you'll never forget it. You'll never get over it Amen. when he does touch you. And you're aware of that, and you give over to that touch. There's no way to explain it. But it's, it's a touch that does something for you that nothing else can do. You see, it's a touch that transforms even the sick. Even the sick. It transforms them. It changes them. It changes them whether it's a physical sickness or, or whether it's a, a spiritual sickness or, or an emotional, emotional sickness, when God touches you, you know, we come down here and we pray and people are anointed. That's, that, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Throughout the Bible, we see people being touched. But it's a transforming. It, it can transform disease. People that are sick. It can make a change in their life. It can bring healing, transform into healing, diseased into healing. In Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 14 and 15, it says, When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in a bed with fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for her. Wow. Wow. Wow, wouldn't you like to have been there that morning or that night or that afternoon, whenever it was, when Jesus came in and she was sick and she touched him? Have you ever experienced that touch, that healing touch that he has? Most of us have. Whether we're aware of it or not, we have. You know, uh, when I was about eight years old, my brother was about two years old, my mother was a nurse, and she had to work because my dad uh, had Parkinson's disease, and he had a, a disability check, but it wasn't enough always to meet the needs. So she would have to work at least part-time and a lot of times full-time for us to just be able to have what we needed to exist. And uh, she worked at St. Joe Hospital, and she was working one night from 7 to 11, which is the third shift, and it was in the night, and my brother woke me up, and he was crying. And I went over to him and realized that he was running a fever. And I touched him, and I don't know if you've ever seen a child, you touch him, and I turned the light on, you could see his little cheeks were red. And uh, I didn't know what to do, so I went in, and I said something to my dad. My dad says, Doris, the only thing I know, maybe you can get a rag and, and get a... a, a something put water in it a bowl put water in it, and you could just sort of bathe him with that cool water and it'd cool him down my mom used to do that he'd, he'd, he'd some of you have seen that some have you ever gotten a, a, a tub of just ice water i mean i've been stuck when i run a high fever my mother would stick me in there i thought man i ain't ever telling her why i'm sick again 
I mean, just, but it, it, they would use that when your fever would get high. We, I got the thermometer out and took it. It was like 104. And that's pretty high for a two-year-old child. And to the point that he was starting to, to say things out of, sort of out of his head. And that really scared me. And I told Daddy, I said, Daddy, and of course my dad wasn't able to do a whole lot. And he, I said, I don't know what to do. And he says, maybe you need to call your mom. And so I called her and she says, I can't come. If I take off work, I, I just can't do that. I guess I could, but I don't have any way to get there because of how bad the weather is. So she was sort of stuck in. And she says, I'll tell you what you do. She said, you get your dad. And you go in there with your brother. And you lay your hands on him and you pray for him. And I remember seeing my pastor, Brother Davey. And he always had this, and I laid mine down there. But on my key ring here, I've got a, a little thing that uh, has oil in it. And this little flask here, metal flask, you take it off and you put the oil on and we anoint as people go around because in James it tells us to do that, to anoint and pray for the sick. And I'd always seen Brother Davy take that oil and, and anoint people. So I thought, well, I want to make sure my brother is healed. I want to make sure. So I tried to do it exactly the way Brother Davy did it. Of course, I didn't have any oil. So what I did is I went in my mom's cupboard and got some Wesson oil. I figured God understood. And I took that Wesson oil and I went in there and I put it on his forehead. And I can remember taking my hand and laying it on him just like Brother Davy. I'd seen him do. And I prayed. My dad prayed. And I remember, I'll never forget, as I prayed, it was almost like I could feel his temperature changing. I could almost just feel it. And I thought, you know, and I'm not so sure. You know, as, as I've grown older, I see where my heart has gotten hard in certain ways in my life because of the world that I live in and the things that get on us. But I just had the faith. I believed that he was going to be healed and he was going to be touched. And when I prayed, it's just like in my mind, I thought, you know, this is a miracle. It's a miracle. This is, God is healing. We've anointed him and we prayed and he, he's being healed. I went and got the thermometer. I shook that thing down and I stuck that thing in his mouth. He was moving, trying to spit it out. I was holding it in. I took it out. It was 102. It already come down to. You know, I was thinking about this touch thing. This morning we were praying in our little prayer group and just so happened Charlie was right in the middle of us. He come up and grabbed my hand and he grabbed his dad's hand and we were all in a circle and we were praying. And I was praying and I can remember times when we would grab hands at home and pray. Or when we would go to my grandma's, we'd go to a friend's house and we'd gather hands and that touch, there was something in it. And my prayer for him this morning was that, that, that he would never forget that touch. Maybe God could do something in that touch that someday he would remember and see the power of a touch from God. 102 degrees. It was a matter of time that God totally took it away. He was up and I couldn't get him to go to sleep. A touch, a touch, a touch of faith. You know, when God comes on the scene and he touches you, touches you he don't mess around. If you're in a need, you know, the devil will come around and he'll try to tell you otherwise. But our God is a healing God. He's a God that will touch your life and you'll never be the same. It's a touch that transforms. It's a transforming touch. It's a touch that transforms the death. It's a, one, he, it's a touch that when, when you can't hear. Now, I was thinking about this. You, you can't hear or you're able to hear. In Mark, the seventh chapter, Jesus, it says, left Tyre and went to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the ten towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. 
And the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man and heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could, not, so they could be alone. He put his fingers in the man's ears. And then he spit on his finger and he touched the man's tongue. Looking up into heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, and replied, Be opened, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Instantly, instantly, he could hear and he could speak. You know, there are those that I believe come in here there's some that have not been able to see. There's some that have not been able to hear. There's some maybe here this morning that have trouble hearing. Our God's a healing God. He's a God that can transform the deaf to be able to hear. Those that can't speak to be able to speak. Those that can't see to be able to see. You know, through the years, my fear is through the years we've heard that over and over again. And we say, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. But do we have it in our heart to where we realize, yes, that is the truth. That is true. It can happen, and it has happened, and it has happened in here in a miraculous way in many different times. And I trust we never forget that. I trust if God has ever touched you and he's ever healed you in anything, that you review that thing in your mind, and you don't lose it, and you don't forget it. And you thank God for it, and you rejoice and, and praise God when you're going down the street and you're driving down the street and you don't have anything to do except get where you're going. To say, Jesus, thank you for that time you healed me. Thank you for that time you touched me. Thank you that time you opened my ears. Thank you that time you healed my heart. Thank, thankful that time you, you took cancer away from me. There are those this morning that are deaf and they can't hear a voice. But there are also others who are deaf because their heart is hardened. And there are people that come in here and God's word is spoken. God's word is sung. Uh, the spirit has spoken just as people sit in the, in the pews and speaks to the heart of men. But our ears are at a place where they can't hear. They can't comprehend. They, they, they can't figure out really what's being said or that it's even being said to them. You know, I've been uh, introduced recently in the last three weeks to a word that when I hear it, it just grieves me. That word is dementia. My mother has been diagnosed with dementia. And uh, what that is... Uh, it's a name of a group of symptoms or disorders that the brain causes the brain not to function properly. Uh, people with dementia sometimes have do have no can't aren't able to do normal activities such as even feeding themselves or, or or dressing themselves, and they have trouble solving certain problems that we just take for granted sometimes. Uh, they imagine things and and they don't live in a sort of a reality at different times in their life. And while drugs cannot change that, they have drugs that can help it and slow it down, but they don't have a drug that can heal it, that can change it and take it away and bring that, that, that ability for the brain to process things properly. You know, and as I was thinking about that in the last few weeks, and I see how that parallels so much and I'm not so sure that there is not a spiritual dementia. Something that the world does to us. Something that uh, sin does to us. That gets us in a place to where we can't process a lot of things around us. To be able to understand even maybe the voice of God. Even maybe the truth when it's preached. You know, there, there's no cure as of now physically that we can hold in our hands. The only cure there is for dementia to the body is Jesus, and he can do it. But there is also a cure for this other dementia we're talking about, this spiritual dementia, that can soften our hearts, 
that can get us to the place. Our world has seen, you know, there's been so many things, things we watch on TV, things that, that, that just totally we don't realize the effect, sometimes even the news, sometimes commercials, things we see on TV, some, some of the shows we watch on TV, the things it's putting in our mind and things it's putting in our heart. I think we need to be very cautious in areas of our life, what we do, where we go, who we're around. Just one touch of the master can bring hearing back. And that's true spiritually. It's a trust, it's a touch that transforms darkness into light, that touch. John 9, 1 through 25, we read, it says, As Jesus was walking alone, a man who was blind from birth said, Rabbi, birth, Rabbi, his disciple asked him, Why was this man born blind? Was it because he, because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned by us, assigned by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then, and then one, no one can work. But while I am here in this world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground made of, mu made of mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Shalom. Shalom, Shalom means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. This man comes back. And his neighbors see him. And they said, what's going on here? I isn't that the man that was, was sitting out there at one time and he was begging? Another one spoke up and said, no, no, no. That, that looks like him, but that's not him. The beggar spoke up. And what did he say? He says, I'm that man. I'm that man. And they asked him, they said, what happened? Can you explain what happened? They wanted to know who this Jesus was and what went on. And, and he, told, he told them that, that he didn't really know who he was. He said, well, well, who do you think he is? And the man says, well, I think he's a prophet. And then on verse 18 it says, the Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could not see. So he called in his parents and asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, We know this is our son, that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said, Because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough. Ask him. So, for the second time, he called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he is the sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. Here is a man who was born blind, I don't know if you could think of what it would be like to be blind, to not be able to see all your life, to not be able to see what your children look like, to not be able to see what your husband or your wife looks like, to not be able to see who your friends look like, to not be able to see some of the things that we see, the beauty that we see around us. You know, there are people, though, that, that are blind, spiritually blind, that are all around us, that can't see, that never have been able to see that have never been born again. They're spiritually blind. They even come through the church doors. Sometimes they've been coming for years, but they, they've never been able to really see. All it takes, though, for that person to see, just like this blind man, all it took was just a touch, just a touch. 
And this morning, maybe there's someone here that you've never seen. You've never, de- never been able to see clearly this Jesus or been, a- been able to experience him or accept him. All it takes is just one touch. It's a touch that transforms the doomed. The doomed. We have a lot of people in the world that are doomed or feel doomed. I was uh, years ago, and you're going to be able to relate to this. Were we able to do that little clip? Okay. We're going to play a little clip here. Some of you all, uh, all recognize this, and, and maybe this is some of us sometimes, okay? store downtown advertised everything for us tall guys. And they had everything except tall girls. <laughs> We have that last part. All right, one more, and then and then tear them both up. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But you know, some of us that have doom and gloom, and you know what we need to do? We need to get over our pity party. That's where we just need to get rid of where we're at. Just get over our pity party. But there are some that do feel doomed. There are some that are, are, are in a place or in a battle and in a struggle. Their life has been doomed by failures. There's things in their life, whether it be a, a job, whether it be others have failed you, and you just feel doomed by, by, by never being able to reach your goals or where you are. There are lives that have been doomed by the past, things you've done in the past things you can't forget, things you still feel guilty of, things that sometimes you feel like God won't forgive you of, doomed by habits that have possessed you. And you think there's no release from those habits. Just one touch. Just one touch. Doomed by broken relationships, marriages that's been broken, and you feel like your life is doomed. I, I've met people and counseled people that, that just have that on them. They, they're, they're doomed. Their life is doomed, and, and they'll never be the same, and, and they can't shake that. God can touch you, and he can free you of that doom, that cloud that rides over you where the light can come in. Doomed by people what people put on you, what people have said about you, how people have expressed things about you, or how people have gossiped by you, and it just has you you in this this doom, this fog is just over you. Matthew 8, it says, A large crowd followed Jesus as he came to the mountainside. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him, I'm willing, he said, be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. Just a touch. Just a touch, and it it was taken care of. Can you realize what it was like to have leprosy? They were separated from their family. They were separated from the ones they loved. They were separated from the town. They were an outcast. They were just with those that had leprosy, could live with them. Can you imagine what kind of life that was for the rest of their life as long as they exist? When I worked in a Kroger store in Houston, uh, sometimes you might pray a prayer 
And I've had this happen more than once. And you don't realize that prayer was answered until it's all over with. And you say, wow, that's an answered prayer. Or God was giving me the opportunity to answer that prayer. But I can remember praying, God, I want to be used today. I want you to use my life. I, I, I'm, I'm going to college, but you can use me right now. And I went to work, and I've been there, I don't know, not very long at all. And in walks this man. And this man is probably not like a man you would see every day, maybe more so today than even back then. But he had this long overcoat on, and it had holes all in it. It was, a, it was ragged, and it was tattered, and strings were hanging down. And he had this plaid shirt on. You could tell there was stuff on his shirt. And, and his beard was looked like milk that was caked in his beard, on the side of his beard. And there's other things that were hanging from his nose that I won't mention. But he was, he was somebody that would just, if you were around him, you would just turn you off. And you just, and, and, but, but see, this was an opportunity. This was a prayer that come walking to me, and that prayer could have been answered. But it, I didn't catch it. I just looked at the man the way he was. I looked at him, and he, I didn't realize the place that he was in. I didn't know his name, but I realized that this was the same man that had come in many times before and I'd seen, and I just had, had ignored him. When he'd come in, he'd always do the same thing. He'd walk in, go down the very same aisle. It's almost like he was tracking his very same steps. And he went down the aisle, he would walk down the aisle, and he would pick up a can of sardines, and they used to have crackers in single packs, and he would pick up a pack of single crackers. Then he would go back to the milk case, and he would get him a, a, a small little pint of milk, and he'd bring it to the front, and he'd pay for it. And the cashiers would sort of, you know, just, and you'd hear them say something about him. And you just sort of had that icky feeling about him, like, oh, I don't want to touch him. I don't know where he's been. Well, that one day he came in, he came up to me, and he said, Sir, there's no sardines like I'm looking for on the shelf. And I told him, Well, on the end cap down there, on the other end, we have a big display of sardines. We had put a display of three for a dollar. It's when those sardines, they started put, making them hot and barbecue and different things like that. And they were stacked down on the end cap. And he went walking down through there, and there just happened to be a lady there with a cart and a little boy sitting in the back. A little boy like, probably about the age of Charlie, like that, about that age, and he's sitting in the back, and this old man just sort of, just sort of strolls by. And as he strolls by, this little boy, he reaches out and grabs this little, this man by the arm, and he pulls him over to him. And the old man looks at him and just sort of surprised, doesn't know how to respond. A little boy just starts laughing. And before long, they have this, it's hard to explain, but they have this relationship that is like it had always been, that they built up with each other for a lifetime. But it was just like all of a sudden. And all of a sudden, something changed within that old man. You saw a smile on his face. You saw his two front teeth, which was all he had. And he just had a, a, a new air about him. And the mother, what was so stirring is the mother, when she turned around and saw it, her first instinct was, uh. And then she saw what was going on, and tears started running down her face. And then tears started running down my face when I saw the tears running down her face and realized what was going on. And then I felt conviction because all he needed was just a touch. This little boy... It says a, a child will teach us. A child will show us the way. You know, there's a song. What this mother was so stirred about, she saw the power of that touched and how it changed and what it did for that man. There's a song that I sang called Shepherd Boy that Ray Bolts used to sing. It says there's a line in there that says, in just a moment he can touch you. Everything will change. When I think about that, in just a moment, he can touch you. Whatever, wherever you're at, whatever condition you're in, 
whatever your battle is, no matter how deep you are, how lost you are, no matter what you habits you have, no matter what disease you have, he can come by and he can touch you in just a moment, instantly, like I bread. Right away, quickly, before you can take a breath, everything change this leper uh, what change I, I wonder how his life changed can you imagine what his day must have been like he was doomed by the disease ravaged by disease there are people that are ravaged by the disease of sin he was separated from those he loved there will come a day that sin will separate us from those that we love we have sin in our life there'll be a separation then and Jesus changed that though instantly instantly and he can change things instantly in you and with you it's a touch that transforms the dismayed transforms the dismayed Isaiah 41 10 says so do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. That word dismay, dismay means to deprive of that strength or firmness of mind which constitutes courage. It means if you're dismayed, you could be discouraged. You could be disheartened. You, you could be depressed. You could be in a low state. You could be, have a sinking of spirit depression dejection yielding in to fear in joshua the seventh chapter we read a story of israel they violated the instructions that god had given them one man had done it Achan. he had taken away a, a his own little booty of things that he kept when everything was supposed to have been destroyed and because of that, God was aware of that. And he sort of stepped back. And Israel went into battle, into, sent some men, 3,000 men, to Ai to fight. And they thought, we can overcome with just these 3,000. But it didn't work out that way. There was like 30 or 40 some people that were killed there. And they were on the run. And they came back and were upset. And it says, Joshua and the elder of Israel tore their clothing in dismay. And they found out it was because of what was going on. There was sin in the camp. Things that had been done wrong. And so J Joshua and, and, and his, his leaders, they just fell on their face. And they were crying out and stuff. And God said, get up and just deal with it. Just deal with it. And it says in verse 24, Then Joshua and all of Israel took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, tent, and everything he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, Why have you brought trouble on us? And the Lord will not bring, bring trouble, now the Lord will bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. They piled a big heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why this place is called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. So he's no longer angry. So what happens? It says, we read here in Joshua 8, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, neither be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you, and arise, go to Ai. See, I have given into thee thy hand the king of Ai and his people, and his city and his land and what happens is God gives gives uh, Joshua some direction and Joshua takes 30,000 men and they go there against Ai and when they go to fight Ai he he follows God's direction and he sends a group of people basically around Ai hidden back sort of like a bushwhack to have a bushwhack and then he takes a group of men and they come into Ai and then they flee from Ai and all of the warriors in Ai come out. And then, of course, the armies come in and they, burn, they completely destroy 
and loot uh, Ai, and then they overcome the soldiers as they come back to rescue their city. So there's victory. There's victory. But then it says, a little later, it says Israel faces, faced a stronger army than Ai. So God gave them a touch. He touched them and gave them what they needed to be able, a blessing, to be able to overcome their enemy. But then they have a greater Gibeon, a city called Gibeon. And there's going to be times that, that God's going to give you a touch. And, and you're going to feel that touch. But you know what? There's going to be some other things that are going to come along. There's going to be other battles. There's going to be other struggles. There, there's going to be uh, needs that you have and opposition that you have against the devil. And, and you're going to need a touch again. He doesn't just have one touch. He'll touch you again. Because we read about how he overcame Gibeon. As a matter of fact, Joshua, what he did is he prayed and asked that the sun uh, and the moon would stand still. And it did. It actually stood still while they fought the battle and won the battle. You know, it says here, it says, it says in verse 13 in Joshua 10, it says, So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in its place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. I was thinking about what happened there. The power. You know, what God did, God, I, I, I think sometimes we don't picture how powerful our God is. I, I don't think that, that he had to stay there and just hold on to that, that sun and moon so it wouldn't move. He had, didn't have to push on it. He didn't have to say, call 10,000 angels. That's like Jesus when he was on the cross. We sing that song, he could have called 10,000 angels. He didn't have to call 10,000 angels. He didn't have to do that. He had the power within himself to take care of whatever was needed. God, as our God, is awesome. He's more awesome than we realize. He has the power, you know, he, he, he could take one finger and just touch that moon and touch that, 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 that uh, sun and it stop right there. With that one finger, he had the ability to, to hold everything in place. You realize what happens is we could have been, man could have been thrown off the earth because Really, what he did, if I'm not, I'm not mistaken, the moon and the sun revolves around. You see, the gravity could have been taken away from us. How great is our God? How great is it? You know, is he? Last Wednesday night, I go and pick up children to come, and I pick up Claire, pick up Cheyenne, I pick up Trey. And I was taking them home, and I was going down the road in front of their house, and I looked up, and I saw the moon. And I said, look up there. You see the moon? And they said, yeah. Are they here this morning? They're back there. They saw, saw the moon. And I said, uh, I said, look up there. And I used to date a girl who had a brother, and we were sitting out on the front porch one time. He was out there with us. And he was looking up in the sky, and he says, looked up there, and he says, look, there's God's toenail. And what it was was one of those crescents like we had. And so I told them, I said, you, you, see that, you see that moon up there? You know what that is? And they said, what? It's a moon. I said, no, that's God's toenail. Well, Claire, she spoke up, and she says, no, it's not. And I thought, it's not? I said, well, what is it? She says, God's bigger than that. He's bigger than that. And all of a sudden, Cheyenne and Trey spoke up and said, Yeah, God's bigger than that. And then Trey said, He's bigger than the universe. Y'all can hear Trey say that. And that touched my heart. You know, if we could just recognize how powerful our God is, and all it takes is a touch to take care of all our problems. To, 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 to work. You know, we sang a song earlier. It says, Water he turned into wine and opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like him, no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, that light will overcome any darkness. Out of the ashes we rise, that's us. He gives us an opportunity to, to rise from death.
to life. Out of the ashes we rise. There's none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, that's your God. If you're here this morning and you can't say that, our God. It says, if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? If our God was for us, then who could stand against? Just one touch. Just one touch. Sometimes we make God so small, we don't realize Then in a blink of an eye, he could change everything, every difficulty we have. I don't know what kind of touch you need this morning. I feel like I did a poor job talking about that touch. But I want to tell you what, that touch, if you haven't experienced it, everything that I missed, he'll give you, and much more. Everything, I I couldn't explain it the way I wanted to. I couldn't explain it in the power that I would like to. But I know he can give you whatever you need, whatever touch you need. Whether you're living in darkness, you might be lost, backslidden. Maybe you're carrying a heavy burden. Maybe you just need more of him. That's that's where you're at. I I just need more. I need more. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. This morning, he can touch you. As we sing, you come if you need to pray. Let's stand.